Well, hey everybody, it's Sandy and welcome back to my channel dedicated to helping you advocate for your own health one topic at a time. Okay, I'm using the phone today again, guys, so bear with me. I'm trying to get better at this. Um, I want to talk today about whether I'm getting a booster and when, because that's been the subject of some discussion in the Facebook group. And so let me give that a quick plug for those of you who haven't gone over there. Uh, Sandy's DIY Health Advocacy does have a Facebook page and it also has a Facebook group you can ask to join. And if you like my content, it's just, it's the similar kind of thing, but it's a little more interactive and people put up questions and comments of their own. And there's some discussions, sometimes heated discussions, usually friendly discussions. And it's just a really nice group. It's helpful. And yeah, I like it. So head on over there if you want to check that out. So yeah, uh, the second booster was approved for people 50 and over. And, you know, frankly, I'm at the point where I don't know why we're like streamlining this so much in terms of like we're hanging on to it and controlling it as though these vaccines are in short supply. Because, you know, whereas when the vaccines first came out, we had lots and lots of people looking for vaccines. Now we have vaccines looking for people. And yeah, I, I kind of think I wish that they would just allow it if it's safe uh, so that it, it could be younger people as well. Um, they do give you a little leeway in terms of underlying conditions and things like that. I know some people had some trouble getting the third shot, not as a boost, but the third full shot, people who are immune compromised. That was approved a long time ago for people who are immune suppressed, immune compromised. And there are some guidelines, but I believe the CDC said that the, it's not really the pharmacist's role to get in there and interrogate people. I think there were some problems with that. And then fortunately, the Wall Street Journal, I believe, came up uh, with a story on it where they highlighted a particular woman's story and then I think they went into some other people's stories where they, they couldn't get their third shot even though they were like organ transplant recipients and severely immune suppressed and after that I think Walgreens is actually the one that came under fire in that article and Walgreens issued a statement that you know they would absolutely be providing the vaccine where they should be and you know, they, they recognized that was an issue and they admitted it. And I, I was so glad to hear that. So if, you th if you're going somewhere where you're getting like a whole lot of scrutiny about it and you're entitled to a shot, you know, uh, maybe go to Walgreens. So um, anyway, I haven't heard of too much of that near me a little bit earlier on. So now there's the approval for the fourth shot or second booster in um, people over 50 years old. Now I'm over 50. And yeah, so the question is, am I going to get it? And people have been talking about in the Facebook group. And, you know, I think I'm going to have a more nuanced approach this time for a variety of reasons. First of all, I, I want, I think it's always good to have, to make a decision using lots of different data instead of just one metric. And I think up until now, we've just been using the metric of time. So if it's been five months or six months or four months or whatever it was at the time, you know, that's when you would get the boost. And I, I don't see anything really wrong with that. We do that with flu shots. We do them once a year. We, we have other thing, other vaccines where we base it on a unit of time, but that's really based on large long-term population studies that look at the immunity, for example. Well, don't get me started on tetanus because the way we do that here in the United States is absolutely ridiculous, but the World Health Organization schedule for tetanus is, um, it's, it's based on long-term studies over many, many people, and it's based on what we know uh, will provide the immunity and not really miss anybody. So, you know, we don't have that with these vaccines yet. I get it, but we do have a lot more information than we had early on. And here's some, one of my take home lessons has been that these messenger RNA vaccines are really a three part vaccine. So the first two in the initial series, plus the boost, it seems to me that I'm thinking of that in terms of that that's fully vaccinated. And I know that's not technically true, but um, that that's how I'm thinking of it because it seems that that third dose is really what provides people with long-term immunity against severe infection and hospitalization. And it seems that that's quite long lived. So I think that the value of that first boost far outweighs the value of subsequent boosts as far as we know so you know at this time so far. And I also think we've come to gather a lot more data. And even though we don't have perfect data and we don't have complete data, I think it's time to start using a more nuanced approach than just time. Um, for one thing, we have learned that this thing comes and goes in waves. Some variants are more threatening than others. Um, there are different parts of the country that suffer different waves at different times. I think it has to do with the times of year where more people are indoors. So like in the colder states, you will see, you know, waves in the winter time when people are driven indoors with, with the heating and everything. Um, if you look down in the south, like during the Delta wave, it was last summer and Delta took a couple more months to really become a problem up north. And it sort of 
got in there at the same time as Omicron up north. But in the south, uh, where it's real hot in the summer, Delta had already had its peak and come down. And I think that's because in the south, when it's so hot in the summer, people are indoors. You know, that's like almost equivalent to winter in the north is summer in the south. That's everybody's inside with the air conditioning and that's when you have more spread. So we have learned that there are timing that we, I, I know that's not perfect and I wouldn't only ba base my boost on timing because there's a little bit of randomness there, you know, but if there's a, so much virus in the population, uh, then you know your odds of bumping into something. And, you know, it doesn't mean your odds are zero when the infection rate is low, but it's a whole lot different than when it's high. So I am using that. I'm also using, you know, what's going on in my personal life. So am I in a situation where I'm going to be in high risk settings? I'm going to have to be in high risk settings. Um, that's absolutely going to in, inform my decision on whether and when to get that next boost. And then finally, I've talked about before antibody titers. I know this is like a bad term or something. The CDC says, oh, don't draw your antibody titers, mostly for crazy reasons, okay? Like you might be drawing the wrong test. You know, you might be doing a nucleocapsid test when if you want to see your response to the vaccine, it would be based on a spike protein antibody test. Well, mind you, most of the tests that are largely available to the public without a physician's order are spike protein antibody tests. So it's just not an issue. Um, the other indictment of antibody testing is that we don't know exactly what the threshold is that where you're protected. That's true. You don't know exactly what the number is, number of quantitative, so number of antibodies that would render you protected. But again, it's not perfect information, just like the weather report that we get isn't perfect. And when I look up in the sky, I'm not getting perfect data. I don't know what's coming along, you know, a few miles away. But I, you, it does tell you something and you can see when they're going up and when they're going down. I, you know, I've talked before on my channel about Dory Segev, who is a transplant surgeon. He was at Johns Hopkins and I guess is now at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York. And he's really very, um, really just such a humble person who's done so much good in the world. But he's the per first physician who started talking about extra doses for people who are severely immune compromised. And he was advocating for his patients, auto uh, immune suppressed patients who have received organs, so organ transplant recipients, and they have, well, people who receive organs as transplant recipients, they are severely immune suppressed because if they're not immune suppressed, then their body's own immune system will recognize the new organ as foreign and fight it. So those people carry with them a burden for life of being immune suppressed. And so he started doing studies on the vaccine response in those people and said, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Um, one shot, two shots wasn't nearly enough with those people. And three is really what made the difference. And in some people that didn't even, that wasn't even sufficient, although in most it was. And he started writing op-eds and finally got the powers that be to agree back when um, that people who are immune suppressed, immune compromised should get that third shot. And I'm full circle with my discussion about like Walgreens and whatnot and um, intermingling pharmacists. But nonetheless, so that was all Dory Segev's work. And he also wrote an op-ed a while back that said it's time to take the, the guesswork out of this pandemic and start using antibody, quantitative antibody titers, semi-quantitative antibody titers. And not that they're perfect and not that we know the threshold, but actually we could learn it if we started using this, okay? This is a perfectly good tool. It used to be that the scale that I've talked about that I recommend the most is the test done at LabCorp, not Quest. And LabCorp has a scale of zero to 2,500, uh, 0.8 would mean positive and 0.8 up to 2,500 is as high as it goes. So, you know, if, if you've just gotten a boost, your antibodies might read greater than 2,500. Because in, in truth, when you've just been boosted and you're at your peak uh, immunity, your antibodies might be in the tens of thousands. So up until a short while ago, the test would only go for up to 2,500. So therefore, if you were 2,501 or if you were 10,000, you really couldn't tell the difference. That would all read greater than 2,500. Well, as of the end of March, that was changed and the scale now goes to 25,000. So yes, I am using that. Um, and to give you a sense of how poor timing is, my husband and I were both boosted at the same time. Uh, six months ago, we both got our antibody, quantitative antibody titers drawn very recently. And his were about 2,500, a little over, and mine were about 7,600. So 
big difference there. I'm going to watch mine. I'm going to see what happens over the next few weeks. Infection rate is low in my area, and I might get a little more bang for my buck a little bit later. Um, and if that changes, I can always head over and just get one. So let me know what your thoughts are on how you guys are doing this, but I think it's time for a more nuanced approach as well. And I don't think one size does fit all. So um, yeah, I, ho I don't hope this was helpful. Until next time, be well. Bye-bye.